Welcome back to Strange Resort, the podcast that lurks in the shadows of otherwise sunny vacation destinations. I'm your host, George Hatfield, and I am still checked into the Dairy Town House, even though I heard strange sounds coming up from the bathroom drain. You didn't find our eggs. You didn't find all of the eggs. You didn't find all of the eggs. Out of all of my visits to supposedly haunted hotels, that moment in the bathroom feels like one of the most authentic supernatural experiences of my life. But I'm still trying to figure out what it all means. I thought it might have something to do with the Easter Day disaster, the explosion that took place at the Kitchener Ironworks. The place where the Dairy Mall now stands. But I have wandered around the mall's many shuttered storefronts, and I have found no clue as to what the spirits might want me to discover. The mall, by the way, is almost a ghost in and of itself. Back in the storm of 1985, parts of this mall were flooded in over three feet of water. One of the business investors at the time claimed it as a total loss. And another investor, Al Zittner, lost his life during the collapse in downtown. But by the late 1980s, the mall was rebuilt and reopened, only to eventually wither into the sad shell it has become. And frankly, that is what much of Derry feels like, like a specter of the past. And as with all specters, this one has unfinished business. Before the 21st century, in the glory days of Derry, the town thrived financially in spite of the horrors that seemed to cycle through the region, a period of tumultuous violence once every 25 to 27 years. But that cycle seems to have been broken, and so it makes me wonder whether I should be looking into the past at all. It's another beautiful day in the Barrens outside of Derry, and I am tromping around with my good friend Ranger McFarland again. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Well, it's getting a little weird, as I mentioned to you, but um, what I'm interested in right now is the sound that we are hearing. Yes, so I stuck around in Derry so that I could observe some of the uh, 2024 broods of cicadas that are emerging right now. Yeah, you said that this was a co-emergence that hasn't happened for over a hundred years. Yes, yeah, it's been a long time and it will be a long time till it happens again. Both of us will be in the ground. All right, so so when these critters aren't making this noise, uh, where are they and what are they doing? So for 17, so for 13 to 17 years, these cicadas, they, um, are pupa underground and they're deep in the tree root and they feed off of tree roots and then they will emerge and kind of after that 17 year or the 13 year mark they'll emerge and they'll mate for about two to three weeks um, and then go die and or uh, lay their eggs and then die in the ground. We've also been looking at the various sewer entrances some of which have long been out of commission and I'm very tempted to enter. I'm not sure why, but part of me thinks that I'm going to find the answers to some of my questions there in the darkness. My mind keeps going back to cycles. The cicadas make me think about the dairy cycle of evil and the mysterious forces behind it. Trish is much more practical, however, and insists that we must find a map and a reliable one at that before we even think of stepping into the drainage system of Derry. 
Um, I was going to ask you, have you either in at night or walking around town, has, have you seen anything or heard anything unusual? Um, you know, I'm not really looking for anything unusual. Um, and I think I'm not going to find it as long as I'm not looking for it. <laughs> All right. So, to find out what lurks below the surface of Derry, both literally and figuratively, I am paying a visit to the Derry Public Library. Much of Derry Township makes me think of the husk of a dead fly stuck in a web. But that vibe changes when I step into the library and walk among the shelves here. This place feels very much alive, and it gives me hope for the town's vitality. And that feeling of hope increases when I meet Helen Deepno, the head librarian. Oh my god, we are such big fans of your podcast. Oh, well, thank you. And we were wondering when you would finally come to Derry. Well, I'm here now. It turns out Miss Deepno is the perfect resource for me. She not only shows me an extensive collection of maps, some of them over a century old, but she has also curated an entire history section focused on Derry. There are several shelves of books filled with stories both inspirational and abysmal. Just be careful where you look. It seems Derry historians are prone to an untimely end, such as Branson Budinger, the author of A History of Old Derry from 1950. He worked on this book for decades, and then, according to the newspaper, he died from a falling accident. But Helen goes on to tell me that though Budinger did die from a fall, it was a fall from a stool in his closet with a rope around his neck. I wonder how she knows more than the Derry newspaper. She points to a painting of her mentor. Mike Hanlon is the absolute best. She tells me he is the ultimate authority on Derry's history, head librarian emeritus. I'm glad she is referring to him in the present tense, because I would love to speak to him, but I'm disappointed to learn that he has not been in Derry for several years. So he's been gone a long time. Well, I hope he'll be back soon. Apparently, he is traveling the world, finally getting to see what life is like beyond his hometown of Derry. Helen has no idea when or if he will return from this sabbatical, but she brightens as she shows me what remains. The Michael Hanlon Archives. Cassette tapes, notebooks, hundreds of photographs. Feel like I've died and gone to podcaster heaven. I flip through some of the photos, wondering if I'll catch yet another glimpse of a clown. But the first thing that grabs my attention is an old 1920s Chevy riddled with bullet holes. The Bradley Gang. To hear some of the old timers tell it, this was one of Derry's proudest moments. But I'll let you listeners be the judge. He thrusts his fists against the post and still insists he sees the ghost. That's right. He thrusts his fists against the post. Before the bank robberies of the Dillinger gang and the rampages of Bonnie and Clyde, there was the Bradley gang. But to understand the rise and fall of this violent era of crime, we need to go back just a bit further to a man named Herman Carl Lamb, also known as the Baron. Born in the German Empire in 1890, he was dishonorably discharged from the Prussian army for cheating at cards. He pursued a twisted version of the American dream by immigrating to the United States and becoming a holdup man. However, he didn't care for the lazy, sloppy style of his Yankee colleagues. And so, this diabolical German mastermind developed a military-like strategy to the art of bank robbery. He called it the Lamb Technique. 
He was the first known criminal to make detailed plans of banks, and he would form a team comprised of specific roles, the lookout, the lobby man, the vault man, and the getaway driver. Before a bloody end to his nefarious career, he was arrested several times, and while in jail, he shared his techniques with fellow criminals, and one of his most eager students was Al Bradley. Bradley had been wanted by the FBI since early 1928, but because he had perfected the lamb technique, he always cased each bank, paying particular attention to the escape route. Things started as a two-man hold-up operation, consisting of him and his brother George, and by the spring of 1929, they had formed an eight-person gang. There was Al and George Bradley, another pair of brothers, Cal and Joel Conklin, the nearsighted Irishman, Arthur Malloy, also known as Creeping Jesus, the diabolical ladies' man, Patrick Cody, the most psychotic of the bunch, Marie Hauser, a quintessential gangster mall who slept with most of the men in the group. There was also George's femme fatale gal, Kitty Donahue. They had successfully completed seven bank robberies, all of which took place in the Midwest. In what would become their last successful job, they kidnapped one of the bankers and held him for ransom. They demanded $30,000 in small bills. And after the money was collected, the banker was returned, a stone-cold corpse. That's when the heat from the FBI intensified. So the Bradley gang dashed away to the northeastern corner of the United States, hunkering down in a rented farmhouse. And after a few months of hiding out, the Bradley gang finally succumbed to cabin fever and decided to go on a shopping spree. The town who had the honor of the Bradley gang as their paying customers? None other than Derry, Maine. Caudy took the women shopping for dresses at Freezy's department store, and the rest of the gang paid a visit to Mackin's Sporting Goods to purchase a massive amount of ammunition. According to Lal Mackin, the owner of the store, he recognized the notorious gangsters right away. The gang's shopping list included hundreds of shotgun shells, 500 rounds of 45 caliber bullets, 800 rounds of 38 caliber bullets, and 16,000 rounds of machine gun bullets. Legend has it that Mackin was as cool as a cucumber and promised the young gangsters that the order would be filled and available for pickup in two days' time at two o'clock. Mackin's promise to deliver a massive amount of ammunition was fulfilled, but not in the way the Bradley gang expected. You see, the shopkeeper spread the word of Al Brady's plans from one customer to the next, until pretty soon the whole town knew that around two o'clock, a band of real-life gangsters would be strolling through Derry. Based on Budinger's account, the police chief James Sullivan was on vacation, bird hunting in the western part of the state. But according to folklorist Sandy Ives, the police chief was in town that week, yet instead of organizing an official police operation, Chief Sullivan just let things take their course. Here's what that looked like. At approximately 1.30 p.m. on October 9th, 1929, the drugstore, the dress shop, the hardware store, the bank, all of these businesses began to lock their doors and put up signs that read things like, be back soon, please be patient. The men of Derry began to coalesce on Canal Street not exactly grouping together, just loitering in singles and pairs, patiently waiting. Standing in doorways or sitting on benches, and all of these men had brought their guns. The men with long rifles took positions in windowsills. Women and children 
stayed clear of the streets, and then the waiting began. The courthouse clock rang. Two o'clock arrived. No Bradley gang. And so, the waiting continued. Then, at 2.25, a red Chevrolet and a blue LaSalle drove down up Mile Hill. As if sensing a trap, the Bradley gang's cars halted in the middle of an intersection. Al Brady opened up the car door, stood on the running board to get a sense of his surroundings, and he must have been unnerved to see an entire township casually staring back at him. Before the vehicles could escape, shopkeep Lal Mackin ran out of his store, accompanied by his employee, Biff Marlowe. According to several eyewitness reports, Mackin told Bradley to put his hands up. But before the gangster had any chance to respond, the shooting began. Mackin opened fire and shot Bradley in the shoulder. The ringleader jumped back into his vehicle, and then the citizens of Derry began to fire all of their weapons at once. The tires on both vehicles exploded. The cars locked bumpers as the drivers panicked and tried to escape. There was nowhere to run, so some of the gangsters hopped out of the car and returned fire. But they were outgunned, and every single member of the Bradley gang was riddled with bullets. And amid the chaos, some of the people, according to the historical notes, said that among the familiar townsfolk, a stranger walked among them. A man dressed in farmer bibbles his hair comically puffy and bright orange, his face white, covered in grease paint, his lips painted blood red. One townsperson noticed the clown standing underneath the movie theater marquee. Another saw him lurking behind the World War I memorial. And then there's this photograph, supposedly taken during the Bradley gang shootout. My first thought was that this person is doing the impossible, floating outside a window. But Helen says that it is simply a case of double exposure. She says that if this were a real photo, we would see the clown's shadow on the building. And yet, there is no shadow. In spite of all these photographs showing these vigilantes, the local newspaper headline read, State Police, FBI, Gun Down Bradley Gang. And yet, the FBI were not in Derry that day. But what confounds me about the town-wide execution of the Bradley Gang is that it is a stunning display of vigilante justice. And yet, in the months that followed, Derry would lose no fewer than 170 children to murder and to unsolved disappearances. 170 kids gone one by one, and yet there was no outcry, no community activism like there was on the day of the Bradley gang shooting. And I can't understand why. But I have a feeling that the answers are somewhere in Michael Hanlon's research. Would it be possible for me to borrow some of this material? Okay, you can check it out for 48 hours. After that, we will be sending the library police after you. <laughs> I think she's joking. Georgie, 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 oh Georgie, don't look down. Oh little Georgie, Georgie, you better leave this town. He thrusts his fists against the post and still insists he sees the ghost. Come on now. He thrusts his fists against the post and still insists he sees the ghost. Everybody! Everybody! 